welcome to Welcome Home. Uh, I think this is our third episode. Mm -hmm. uh, last week we had uh, Don Cummings with us with uh, Women of Purpose, the ministry there at Harford Baptist Church. I'm Senior Pastor Jason Bratcher, Harford Baptist Church. And with, as always, Brother Jonathan McCree, our uh, youth pastor, missions director, uh, and whatever else you know i love as a senior pastor you have that little clause in everybody's contract and other things as assigned uh jonathan covers all of the, a lot of those as assigned so uh, cool. i appreciate him for doing that uh but uh today it's just going to be me and jonathan we're going to have a little discussion uh on a pretty uh prominent topic in uh our social uh media or political uh, influences, everything in the United States right now. And we're gonna do this a, uh, maybe a little different from a lot of people, though me and Jonathan have the same views and we have the same uh, biblical uh, outlook on this issue. I'm going to come at it from the opposite side and question Jonathan and his apologetics uh, about this topic. And the topic today is abortion. And uh, as we, and I know that's a very hot and sticky subject, but uh, in case you don't know, my view, and I think I can speak for Jonathan as well, is we are very much pro-life and uh, so don't take anything we say today. Again, remember, I'm speaking as the opposite opinion, okay, or the opposite direction. Uh, and to start that today, I'm going to, uh, I'm referencing an article uh, by, uh, I don't know that I would call him an extremist, but someone that is very vocal about anti-pro-life. Uh, I pulled one of his articles that he has written. Uh, his name is uh, Brian Bolton. And I, I'm going to use uh, some of his writings of that article, which the title of his article is, God is so not pro-life. With a subheading, what does the Bible say about abortion? And uh, so we're going to use some of his references today as the... Uh, the opponent of pro-life. So uh, I just want to make it clear that where we get our information from and, uh, and I think now, honestly, uh, Jonathan, I don't know anything about Brian Bolton other than what I read in this article, but uh, I just went through and Googled articles about uh, anti-pro-life. And this is one of the a few that made some, uh, I'm going to call them popular. Uh, uh, or the better arguments of the other side. Yes, yeah, some of the some of the, yeah, without getting very left, uh, pretty straightforward. So I'm going to start. I'm just going to read what I would call the introduction to his uh, article, and it goes like this: It says a prominent fundamentalist Christian minister and television celebrity regularly proclaims that unborn chil an unborn child has a God-given right to life, that life is a gift from God, and that abortion is the sinful destruction of God's sacred creation. These and similar assertions are thoroughly refuted by God's Word, the Holy Bible. It goes on. Defenders of women's reproductive rights should know what the Bible actually says about abortion and by extension, related issues, including, and he goes on, we're not going to get into these today, but contraception, the morning after pill, in virtual fertilization, and fetal tissue research, uh, just so that I can complete his article, but we're not going to get into those issues today. And he starts out by, he gives a list of 10 scriptures, uh, and his uh, I'm going to call it his synopsis of what those scriptures mean to him related to the topic of abortion. And uh, Jonathan, the, the first thing 
uh, that jumps out to me is Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 25. And uh, do you have that pulled up? Yeah, um, yeah. let me get it uh, just a second. Um, I think it would be good if we can put that on the screen and we'll read that. Just so everybody, you know, we're not just pulling something out. All right. Uh, yeah. Left hand, Paul. Yeah, can you scroll me to 21? Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry. You're right, 22 and 25. All right, so this is what it says. We're reading from the ESV. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fine, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. Okay. Now, his synopsis of that scripture, not mine again, but Brian Bolton's, where he gets his, I don't know, we have to take it that it's his words here. He says this, a pregnant woman who is injured and aborts the fetus warrants financial compensation only, it says to her husband, suggesting that the fetus is property and not a person. Um, All right, Pastor Jonathan. Get yeah, um, which is, about. that's not even what it says, um, which I'm going to put back on the screen here. Um, okay. So his claim is that a woman who aborts the baby, um, that the, the, the guy who caused the accident is fined. That's not at all what it says. If we look at verse 22, um, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so their child comes out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall be fined. So here we have, there is no harm. Both the mother and the child are alive. That guy is still fined. It, no, the fine is in place if he causes the premature delivery. Then he is fined. But when we, when we go further, um, it's going to say, um, well, verse, uh, verse 20, yeah, 23, oh, yeah. but if there is harm, so if the mother dies, mother and the child, or the child dies, the, now he may argue, which he didn't argue this, but others I've seen argue that, well, it doesn't say who's harmed. The Hebrew is ambiguous. Well, it is because it's referring to both the mother and the child. It doesn't specify the mom or if it's the child because it's talking about both. That's why it's not specific. It says if there is harm, then it is life for a life. So if that baby dies, you pay with a life. Mm -hmm. Eye for an eye. Now that seems to be like a defect, not quite dead, but there's a defect. No, but it's, you bet. And of course, this is, this is a old Hebrew saying, you know, the life for life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is you pay for the damage. Likewise, if that mother dies or the baby dies and chances are, if the mother dies, the baby's going to die too. You pay life for life. This right. is capital punishment. Um, this okay. isn't a, you can look elsewhere in Exodus where it talks about if you accidentally kill somebody's animal, you kill them, you pay a fine. But if you kill a human, it's life for life. And uh, one thing that this actually shows us that a child's life is more important than an adult's life. If you were to say, um, you accidentally killed me. We were out horsing around on four wheelers and you ran me over on accident. Of course, we got, you, we got to do Old Testament law. And I know they didn't have four wheelers. So maybe we'll say oxen. You're riding an ox and you accidentally run me over and kill me. <laughs> um, you, don't get, you didn't get the life for life because it was an accident. No, Hebrews had a word, thou shall not murder, even though the King James says thou shall not kill. That's, that's a mistranslation. They had a word for murder and a word for kill. If you mm -hmm. accidentally killed me, you were allowed to go to one of the six refugee cities. And you were on house arrest until the high priest died, and then your sentence was over. Right. So you got basically house arrest was your punishment. But if you accidentally kill a baby, it's life for life. So that unborn child is God's actually placing a higher life on that unborn child than he would on my life. If you accidentally kill me, it's just house arrest in the Old Testament. Accidentally kill my wife's child, you pay with your life. Yeah. You know, so this, this, why he cites this passage, I don't get it because it, it doesn't say that. This is one of the most pro-life passages in the entire Bible. Well, that, that's, what, that's what I was getting ready to interject. The scripture he uses to make that point absolutely refutes 
his point that he's trying to make. And his point he's trying to make is, is that it's not seen as a life, but it's seen as property. Uh, and I can't even, it's a big stretch to even make that comparison whatsoever out of that. And only stretch you can say is that there's monetary uh, uh, retribution to the husband if the baby comes early. I mean, that's, that's the, the only thing I can see there that he can even stretch that to a piece of property instead of a life. But if he goes on and concludes that, which uh, us as uh, educated Christians, hermeneutics, mm -hmm. if you continue to read the story and, and put it all in context, basically it's saying exactly what you just said is that that child's life's worth more than the mother's. And uh, wow, I, I, I can't even see how he can even begin to pull that out of that. Yeah, that it was a um, sloppy interpretation at best. Um, but at best, classic case of, I guess, I said Jesus, where he's reading into verse 22 what he wants verse 22 to say, and I'm just going to ignore verse 23. Right. Yeah. Uh, even though he does cite that in his article, but that seems to just be referring to 22. But one thing that, uh, which I don't know if he does later in his article, but others who want to attack the personhood of the child, whether they call it, you know, property or a clump of cells, even science today has rejected that it's anything less than human. Because um, right. we got that in sonograms. Anyone can get a sonogram now, realistic sonogram, and you can tell that's a baby. Mm -hmm. To the point of now where 73% of mothers who were thinking about abortion, if they ha or live in a state where they're required to have a sonogram ultrasound first and see the baby, 73% back out of the abortion. Because that's how much they realize that that's a child. Mm -hmm. But one of the most fascinating, uh, this, is, this is just pure science. Um, Diane Irving, who's a biochemist and biologist for Georgetown University, um, she wrote an article um, that surprisingly, uh, was a normally when you get something out of a university, you expect it to be a, a pro choice or something very liberal. Very liberal, correct. But it, it came out in, in hugely in the uh, pro life favor. Um, what, what she had done is a genetic study um, looking at chromosomes, and you know, she took a we can clearly see distinction between human parts. What I mean by that is, is the egg of a woman and the sperm of a man. We can clearly tell that these are what she would call less than human. They're not human. They're human parts was the term that she would use. They're only 23 chromosomes a piece and they don't qualify to be human, the egg and the sperm. Right. But she, her study, she, she, she suggests, what she suggests, she states that one instantaneously when that sperm hits that egg, it no longer can you tell where the egg is or can you tell where the sperm is immediately, instantaneously, it becomes a 46 chromosome, you know, my, plus or minus you know, Down syndrome or Turner syndrome, right, right, those, right. those genetic disorders. But it becomes a 46 chromosome life form, which is characteristic of a human being. You know, most of us, unless we have one of those two syndromes, we're a 46 chromosome being. Mm -hmm. you know, and she goes on to give other you know, details why she suggests this, but she says, insta basically, to sum up her argument, that uh, upon fertilization is the initiation of a new human being. Genetically right. wise, there's nothing else she could call it. It's a human being. It, genetically, it fits all the, the requirements of a human. And that's where the, that study at Georgetown has determined life begins at the fertilization of the egg. You know, and, and of course, we're going to uh, give our uh, apologetics our Christian uh, reasons why we're against abortion. But what I like about that part of, I'm going to call it your argument against this is uh, you're using, first of all, science, which there's a lot of those out there, uh, activists, if you will, for abortion that want to use some type of uh, scientific reasons why and using science to prove our stance. But the other thing is that uh, because of another part of those activists out there 
is on a women's rights to do. And this is a woman scientist that is making the claim. So, uh, yeah, I, I really like that defense. Uh, we scripturally looked at that. Uh, we refuted the scriptures that they used for their stance, or Brian Bolton, I think was his name, right? Yeah, Brian Bolton. I want to make sure I say his name right. I don't want to misquote that and get sued. Uh, but he uh, it refutes his, I'm going to call it a loose interpretation of scripture. I think it's even worse than that. Uh, but uh, we refuted that by scripture, but also for those that, uh, support abortion because of science and because of women's activists and all these things were showing that even women in the scientific field are proving that it immediately it is a human being it's got as you said the 46 chromosomes so uh, i think we can put to rest that that the uh, unborn fetus is property yeah there's yeah it's a breathing i mean it's it's not breathing but it's a uh it's a being it's a human being uh now i, I got another question uh to give you uh and maybe we'll go back to some of brian's stuff on this too and, and i'm going to but the question i want to ask is what about a child conceived in rape or incest? And uh, let me give you one of the, another one of the scriptures that Mr. Bolton, uh, and again, uh, I want to say this too. We're not here to beat up Mr. Bolton at all, by no means, but these are some of the arguments that are against our view, and I just want to use those. But he uses Numbers chapter 5, verses 11 through 31, and, and uh, to to make this assumption, uh, and in that he says the gruesome priestly purity test to which a life accused of adultery must uh, submit the will and will cause her to abort the fetus if she is guilty, indicating that the fetus does not possess the right to life. And that gets me back to that question. What about a child conceived in rape, incest? Let's, it's, and my question is going to go on a little farther, even adultery. Okay. And uh, so I want to ask you, Jonathan, again, through his scripture, how can we uh, apologetically or defend our view by the use of his scripture? Well, one, and I, just like before, I'm going to start with his scripture and kind of question his conclusion. Like, does it, does it really say that? Right. Because um, the, the examples you've provided so far, it's he, he, he cites scripture, but then he seems to say something that scripture does not say. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to pull up the actual end of that passage. I was following along as you were reading that mm -hmm. um, briefly and quickly. And I, and I, of course, likely I'm skimming it. But one thing I noticed at the end um, I'm, I'm going to start in verse 27 here. Uh, yeah, 27, 28. And when he has made her drink the water, then if she has defiled herself and has broken faith with her husband, the water that brings the curse shall enter her and cause bitter pain. Her womb shall swell and her thigh shall fall away and the woman shall become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive a child. Verse 28 implies this woman's not pregnant at this point. She's on trial for a, a adultery, yes, but she's not pregnant. You no, know, because if, if she passes, then she'll conceive a child. But mm -hmm. when we look before, I, I'm thinking maybe this is what we're, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, you know, just accusing him of not lying, but just sloppy hermeneutic, is he may be reading, her womb shall swell and her thigh shall fall away. Maybe he's saying, maybe he's seeing that as a miscarriage, but yeah. the, Basically, what's saying you're going to become infertile. Your womb is going to be defective, and the the language of your thigh shriveling away is you're going to lose your sex appeal. Yeah. No, and that that's what it's saying. It's not saying a miscarriage. That's not what that's saying. And, you know, in verse twenty eight, the woman's not pregnant. Yes, now, if she passes, will, this, that she will be able to conceive. Yeah. 
Yeah, she's she's not, she has yeah. not conceived at this point. Right, right. right. Um, so he's he's bringing sloppy, slop at, at best sloppy hermeneutic, um, yeah. trying to read into a passage something that's not there. But one thing that I I, I do want to I'm gonna use another scripture here. Um, let me get it queued out before I take us to it. Make sure I'm going to the right spot. Just one second. <laughs> Should I be doing some kind of uh, music like? Doing yeah, as I, as I try to find what I want, no, I found it. Okay. Um, but uh, Deuteronomy chapter twenty-four, verse sixteen: Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall put, be put to death for his own sin. So here we're going back to that original question that you asked. Now, what about a child conceived in rape or incest? Mm -hmm. Well, what did the child do that's wrong? Right. Well, grand, so, and, and let me back up. We can't play down what the, what the woman has went through. Um, assuming that the woman is the victim. We know now there, there's times where the actual a young man was a victim by an older woman. We, we know that. But most cases, it's a woman attacked by a man. Mm -hmm. Um, but so that one, we need to let her know that, you know, she's not done nothing. We need to show her compassion and support, but we also need to help her understand that killing the child is not the solution. Um, and in scripture, you know, we have to go back to that passage we just read. What sin did the child do? Yeah. The father did sin. Yes. And the father, the, the father, of that baby who attacked you deserves to be punished, but the child does not. Scripture is clear. The child is not to be put to death because of the sins of the father. And, and we're, we're violating that if we do that. And, and to reinforce what you're saying there is the first question we uh, went after in his first, it established, uh, I think we established that at conception, it is a child, it is a human being. Mm -hmm. So if we look at it that way, then it is uh, it is a child at that point, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I think it's important for, to establish uh, the answer to this question: What about a child conceived in rape or incest? We have to understand that at the moment of that conception, how ill it was, it's still a, a child. It's still a being at that point. So uh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, we, we need to we need to establish that at that conception, no matter if it was ill conceived or whatever, it's still a human being. Yeah, um, you know, in uh, Luke, uh, which I'm not going to go to and read into, but Luke Luke chapter one verses thirty five and thirty six talk about you no, know, most likely what is yet a yet to be conceived Jesus and a conceived J John the Baptist who's still in Elizabeth's womb. And the angel says, you know, to Mary, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. Doesn't say she's conceived a clump of cells or there's something inside her growing that will be a son. He says she has conceived a son. She mm -hmm. is a, the angel, the messenger of God has acknowledged John the Baptist as a child. Yeah. And didn't so, say you get, she's got property in her room. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a, a child, a huvios in Greek. It's, it's a child, a son. Is, she has conceived a son. Right. Right. Uh, we've uh, we've looked at a couple of, I think, in my opinion, from the questions that I see and the conversations I see, a couple of the hot subtopics of uh, pro life. Uh, but here, here's a question I got to kind of bring our session here today to a, a close, if you will is is there forgiveness from God after engaging in the sin of abortion? And because I don't want anyone out there that's not a Christian, an unbeliever, or those that support uh, abortion to think that we think they're all going to hell in a handbasket and that uh, there's nothing that can save them. There's nothing that can get them to heaven. 
So my question is, is can we, through apologetics here, give hope maybe to someone? And when I say hope, uh, what I mean is everlasting hope for even committing this sin of abortion. So could you lead us in some of that? Yeah, um, there, uh, abortion, especially in the, man, the starting in the 70s, late 70s, um, when, when it was legalized, but through the 80s and 90s, we were a very, even, even in the Southern Baptist Convention, we were, we were a pro-choice as a convention, and a lot of Christians had abortions. A lot of people who would become Christians had abortions. But yes, there is forgiveness for that. And before I go for I'm going to look at some scripture because we want to look at scripture for everything that we share. We don't want to just say it. Um, but we have here, uh, this is John's first epistle. First John, starting in verse 9 of chapter 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not with us. So two things that, well, yeah, there's two things that I want to address on that one. No, is there forgiveness to be found? Um, for the believer, yes. Um, the believer who has that trust and faith in Jesus will have forgiveness. Anyone outside of that relationship with Jesus who hasn't, doesn't serve him as Lord and Savior, um, that I have to say, as every other sin that you've done, no, there, you have no forgiveness. They're outside of Jesus. It is Jesus who forgives us and cleanses us of that righteousness. You need to be in the faith. You need to be in him and washed by his blood, and you can have cleans, cleanliness. But that, that second verse, verse 10, um, this, this is what I think we need to be really honest with ourselves. I'm going to put it back on the screen. Um, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not with us or in us. The one thing I would encourage believers to do is to, we have a habit of denying our sin because we don't want to admit that we're wrong. Um, you know, but of course in this, with abortion, you know, we don't want to admit, and I say we, I'm a man, so I've not had one, but I have someone very close to me in my life, family member who has. Um, and even to this date, she's in denial that it's a sin because she doesn't want to admit what she did. In my, in my view, I believe the view of scripture is, is, is murder. Um, and it was that unjust killing of that, of that infant child. Um, but she doesn't want to acknowledge that because if you do, you know, you have to, if you acknowledge it's murder, then you have to acknowledge you did wrong, but that's okay. We can admit that we sin. We're to confess our sins, repent of our sins, there's no shame in saying, hey, I messed up, God, you know, forgive me of this. Um, John goes on to say, if we can't recognize our sin, God's, God's word isn't in us. You know, that we're liars. We're lying to him. We're lying to ourselves. So my, my encouragement to women, yes, there is forgiveness in Jesus. You know, go to Jesus with that sin. You know, seek, his, seek forgiveness. Seek repentance. Put that behind you. Don't repeat that mistake. God forgives that sin. That's not an unforgivable sin. Um, but we, we do need to have our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Yes. Um, outside of him, we're not forgiven, but in him, we are forgiven. I agree. And, uh, and I know you were referring to the women that had the abortion, but in so many cases, uh, even yeah. though the man... Pressured them into it. Yeah, he has to commit to it. <clears throat> uh, so men... Uh, the same forgiveness that Jonathan was just speaking to uh, to the women, it, it's yours too. And Jonathan is 100% correct. You have to be in Christ. You have to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness. If you're outside of that, uh, as, un, as gruesome as it sounds, you're hell bound anyway. Uh, but to come to Christ, you know, we have a tendency as human beings to classify sin. You know, even us as Christians, we seem to think that uh, we classify abortion or murder or some of those things more than uh, robbing a convenience store. Uh, you know, but sin is sin in the eyes of God. 
And he says there in the scripture, which John, uh, Jonathan used there, the first epistle of John, all sins can be forgiven if confessed. <clears throat> and I'm not talking about to the pastor of Hartford Baptist Church, but confessed to Jesus Christ. And so encouragement today is we talk about a topic of abortion, very controversial topic. There's hope. There's hope for those that maybe, uh, and the hope I'm talking about is not living with yourself better today, but the hope that there is a better eternity. And, uh, and if you have been involved in an abortion, since we're on that topic today, uh, all of that type of eternal hope is not lost in you. Uh, that hope is in Jesus Christ. And if you take nothing from what we said today, and, and, and I pray honestly, that anything we've said today, if you don't take the stance that Jonathan and myself does, uh, we did not uh, irritate your senses. That's not our intent. Our intent is to make you aware of our view and not based on our understanding, but our, of the, inter the correct interpretation of the Word of God. So by no means do we uh, have this topic today to, to, as the old boy says, stir up a hornet's nest. No, we just want to put our view out there and, uh, and hope that maybe uh, enlighten you on our view and why we come to that conclusion. And if nothing else, we hope that it gets you to question your view if it's not the same of ours. Um, and... I'd like to put out there that uh, if if you would like to talk to Jonathan or myself about this, uh, we welcome that. Uh, you can go to our website, www.hartfordbaptistchurch.org, and there you can go to the staff portal, and you can email directly Jonathan or myself, either one. Uh, the church's phone number, which with the COVID-19, we're not there very much. I'll put the email in the description on YouTube as well. So they can look right down there below this video and they can email either one of us. Absolutely. Uh, so we don't want you to look at this, uh, any of our broadcasts that we do as anything to try to strike a nerve with anyone. We're just trying to uh, indoctrinate, if you will, those that are not familiar with our views and how we come to those uh, to make you think about it. And if you think about it and uh, want to hear more, we would love to speak with you about it. Uh, Jonathan, you got any closing remarks you'd like to say? Yeah, just one, one more quick and, and I guess a, a passage of, uh, or a story of, a, of God's forgiveness and how merciful he is. You know, um, King David is one of the most beloved characters of the Bible. He's one of the most respected in the Bible. He's viewed as the greatest king in Israel's history. Yeah. And he's called a man after God's own heart. King David committed adultery and murder. Yep. And he was forgiven by a gracious God. So, it, you know, it, it doesn't have to be abortion. Like you said, any sin that we've done, um, God's a gracious God. He can forgive it all. Nobody is too far gone. If you are repentant of it and you want, and you place that faith in Jesus, you know, knowing that he died on the cross for your sins and that you're going to give your life to him, you're going to be saved of that. Yes. You no, know, but, but it starts with, you got to be honest with yourself and acknowledge that we are sinners and even Christians continue to be sinners and they have to be honest with themselves. You know, as a Christian, I'm still a sinner. Um, but, but, it's honesty on our part and also seeking God, you know, and his forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, and King David is a classic example of someone who failed horribly, but also is a great example of God's grace, forgiveness for, of all that stuff he did. Amen. Well, Donovan, thank you for our talk today. Uh, look forward to the one next week. I don't know what our topic's going to be or if we may even have a guest. I don't know. Uh, we've got seven days to figure it out. God created the world in seven. Surely we can figure out what we're going to talk about next. Yeah. Uh, 
again, I want to say to you, yeah, those that are watching, welcome home. Uh, and when I say welcome home, I mean welcome home to Hartford Baptist Church, where we worship an almighty God. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions about anything about the church, go to our website. It's already been put out there. It'll be available to you. Call us. Let us know. Jonathan, have a good evening. You too. All right. Bye-bye.